Uh, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first, uh, very many thanks for, uh, for asking me to speak here today. Uh, I, I think whenever I see Vera, uh, I think she mentors me rather than the other way around. Uh, a quite remarkable person, and uh, you're very lucky, in my view, to have her working with you. I just want to say a few things today about a country which has uh, always interested me when I was in the Foreign Office, I was Minister for Africa, and I'll refer to that again in just a moment, but a country that has always been of very great interest because I suppose, like many other people in government, I was concerned with and interested in how countries that had considerable reserves of, uh, of natural gas and, and of oil began to make the transition from petrodollars to sustainable progress. How was that going to be accomplished? How could the future be at least in some sense secured? It interested me, uh, not least because of my own background. Uh, you've been kind enough to mention the football part of it, but let me just uh, mention one or two other things. I've spent a lot of time in my life in education. I've been a lecturer, a researcher, indeed a, a professor at, uh, at UK universities and in the United States, and twice I've been Minister for Higher Education. Uh, the first time round in Tony Blair's government, uh, the second time round in uh, Gordon Brown's government, I thought the second time round was probably a punishment for the things that I must have done wrong the first time round, but nonetheless it was always an exciting thing to do. So talking about uh, higher education and what it can contribute is dear to my heart. In the Foreign Office, I was Minister, among other things, for Africa. But I also had an unusual brief, uh, one which I treasured. It was what was called in the jargon, uh, my, my colleague diplomats will recognise this, it was called public diplomacy, what's sometimes called soft diplomacy. The uh, broad diplomatic work that is done, often with people from a variety of different countries and often with education right at the centre of it. And indeed, I was responsible, among other things, for example, for the Chevening Scholarships, the Commonwealth Scholarships, the Marshall Scholarships. And the Chevening Scholarships were scholarships which were highly treasured, not least by students who came from Libya. And I treasured the fact that they were here. And finally, and this is much more recent, I've been advising uh, the Irish higher education system on distance learning. And the interesting thing, as I even say that sentence, is that you can be advising a country, Ireland in this case, but you're talking about distance learning, which knows no barriers at all. There are no borders to distance learning. It is a global phenomenon. It is delivered through the latest global technologies. It is, of its very nature, international. And in doing that, it's been possible to consider, and let me just give you a quick example, it's been possible to consider with the government of China the way in which teachers, pharmacists and others can be brought to standards which China understandably wants right across its countryside, uh, even in the smallest villages. In business now at the Salamanca Group, uh, we do have, uh, as you're kind enough to say, an office in Tripoli. We're principally involved in oil and gas and risk mitigation. We're, we're involved in building resilience, which of course is particularly important in some countries. And if I may say so with uh, d due respect, I, I think uh, uh, it, it is certainly a responsibility we feel in relation uh, to Libya. But also it's a business which deals to some extent with education. We uh, help try to place people in schools, in further education and in higher education. And that is not an easy task. As, uh, as Mr. Fear said in what I thought was a very interesting presentation just a short while ago, you can't just simply pick people up and put them down somewhere. They have got to have the attainment and capabilities which give them the very best prospect of succeeding in the place where they are going to study. And that has been very important for us. It's got to be relevant education. It has got to be within the realm of what is attainable. And I wonder if I may, in just a, a few minutes, because there are obviously only a few minutes, just say what I've thought the purpose of the discussion that you've been having might be. 
certainly a purpose which I would take very seriously. The first purpose of creating a new cadre of people who have more advanced levels of education, not only at the very top of higher education, but advanced at every level that they can attain, is the task of nation building. I think Vera also mentioned that. It is of building economic and business sustainability. It is of building a professional group in a society. And although it's a very old fashioned term, and I apologize for using it, of building what I would have described in the past as a middle class. It is the building of, of a group of people who are capable of sustaining the most fundamental requirements of an economy that is growing and also a nation that's growing with institutions that are secure and where the people at the top of those institutions are capable of doing a good job. All of those things that I've just described are what I suppose could be summed up in the word capacity and capacity building. And the interesting thing to me about capacity building is that it is always an intergenerational thing to do. If you can help both building capacity in your own country or help another country in building its capacity, you leave the strongest and most profound legacy that you can possibly leave. It trumps everything else, actually. It is the means by which people can finally take a hold of their own destiny, create the greatest prosperity, and give the greatest chances to their own children. And that is, of course, why it is so highly valued. Nowadays, building that strength, building uh, that kind of capacity is not just about young people and the intergenerational passage of knowledge. It is also about making sure that the adults in a society also upgrade their knowledge, are able to respond to all the differences and challenges which they will experience with greater and greater speed, greater rapidity in the modern world. And they do so in the modern world. It's a global environment. I found that the lessons of running the Achievening Scholarship Scheme in the United Kingdom was that what we did was not only provide an educational opportunity which I think people enjoyed and treasured, but we also brought them together and they enjoyed each other. They, they treasured each other. And I can think of a number of examples. One particularly sticks in my mind, which was with the students who come from Mexico, where we encouraged them to meet again every year in the embassy in Mexico City to renew that friendship, to renew the contacts. And of course, they did so. Some of them married each other. Some of them, uh, some of them went on to run businesses together. Some of them put together university courses together. They had formed a bond, which I hope we had provided the basis for uh, in the United Kingdom. And what they had in particular was a very broad sense of ability. They were not simply trained. I'm always a bit worried about the word trained. It sounds like you're uh, trying to convince your dog to behave in a well-mannered way. It's not that. It's, it's a much, much broader thing than that. It's a deeper understanding, and it is an ability not just to acquire a range of skills, but to be able to understand what is changing in the world and to change with those changes. It is about potential, not just about knowledge that has been acquired in the past. The ability to deploy potential. And that, I think, is very, very fundamental. It is about changing with the world. Nothing is future-proof, of course, but getting as close to future-proof as you can in any one moment. That requires people to also learn to be courageous. Uh, as we heard uh, uh, from Vera and from others, uh, leaders have to have courage. They have got to be able to take risks. There is no such thing as entrepreneurship without risks. And I know in dealing, for example, with the civil servants in various ministries in uh, London, that when you talk to very many civil servants about developing business, they were most frightened of the concept of taking risk. But of course, you don't develop any business unless you're prepared to take well-judged risk. I'm not talking about doing things wildly. I'm talking about making judgments about what risk to take and quantifying it. In practice, in my view, uh, this means that we need to do some of the following things. Firstly, we need to plan for the people we intend to help, uh, the people we intend to engage with and to advance. 
We need to plan proper pathways for them. Long-term links between uh, education at uh, all post-school levels, possibly at school level as well, but let me just focus on post-school levels, between education and business experience. We need new models for doing that. Some of the old models, just placing somebody uh, in a, a business environment who would normally be in a university environment for a couple of weeks or whatever, doesn't really work. The world's much more complex than that. It needs a much more fundamental design of pathways. And those are not only economic models for how to develop pathways, but they're also cultural models. There is no point in people believing that they can uh, help people advance if they haven't made real, uh, a real uh, assessment of how that can be done in any particular culture. The people who make the worst mistakes, in my view, are the people who think that their culture is exactly the same as everybody else's culture and don't make the effort to find out and learn about that and build it in. It is not... Um, uh, uh, it is not a simple process. You need to plan into these pathways real challenges so that people can test out for themselves what they're capable of and how they respond to challenge. I think one of the harshest lessons in my life was when I was in merchant banking in Zurich in uh, 1987 when there was a massive uh, financial collapse. My goodness, in 48 hours, you began to understand the limits of what you could deal with I'm not suggesting we should organize massive financial collapses, you'll understand, but it is important to build in challenge. It is not an inexpensive option. N n ignorance, of course, costs you far more than knowledge in the long term. The great and the important thing about it is to make sure it is done properly and done to the highest standards that can be attained. That involves, obviously, for any country, working with its own institutions and cooperating with international institutions and making sure that students from those countries, Libya in this case, take a full advantage of the international opportunities that there are in education. Uh, and that will involve some very complex issues in the pathways I've described, including being able to demonstrate what you've learned and to get credit for it so that that credit can be transferred across borders. That is by no means easy, but it is actually very, very helpful. None of this, if I can sum it up, none of this works without a proper plan. It has to be carefully designed. It has to be put together in a way which is capable of being tested so that you know whether you're really succeeding or not. There's no point in plowing ahead, not knowing whether it's working or not. So it has to be properly planned, carefully designed, and capable of being scaled. No ambitious nation ever just does a bit. The art is to try and do the maximum that is possible. Bill Clinton, actually, funnily enough, the last time I met uh, President Clinton was in this very hotel, and in this part of it, the West Wing, which, uh, of course, was the name of a wonderful television program, which is allegedly about his period in office. But um, pr President Clinton uh, had as his Secretary for Labour the eminent uh, Professor of Economics, Robert Reich, who said, what is it we need for the 21st century? Uh, is it exactly what we've needed in the past? And he said that the critical thing in any country is the quality and the ability of its people. The big companies will decide where they're going to locate themselves. The major enterprises will decide whether they want branches in the places where the people have the greatest range of skills and the greatest ability to show their potential. That is what will make an economy successful and actually in a competitive world will achieve the best results in competition. That is a profound understanding. It's not just what you can get from under the ground but what you can get from the people, from their brains, from their uh, emotional sensitivities, from all of the things that represent the qualities of human beings. For Libya, uh, of course, the nation must own its own changes, but it could and it should, and I believe it will, call on its friends. And we are among them. Thank you very much. <laughs>